Mateo Lesteri in Argentina, where he completed his studies, bachelor and PhD at the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba, before working at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, University of Cambridge, University of Durham, and at the University of Massachusetts. Since 2002, he is professor. 2002, he is professor of astronomy at the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the University of Victoria in Canada. He won some prizes from the University of Victoria and from the Humboldt Foundation. And in 2015, he won the Henry Marshall Tory Medal of the Royal Society of Canada. This year, he has been selected as a 2020 Citation Laureate by the Institute for Scientific Information at Claribate. He made and still makes significant contributions to theoretical studies of dark matter halos accompanied by massive and body simulations to the understanding of the scaling laws relationships in the London CDM universe. I think there is nobody that works in galaxy clusters or groups that have never set the acronym NFW from the Navarro Frank and White profile, which refers to his classical works of 96, 97, a cornerstone for understanding the nature of a structure formation. So this way, we welcome Julio to begin with his presentation. Thank you, Julio Navarro. Um, Eu só queria dizer, para começar, antes de começar, eu só queria dizer muito obrigado pelo convite. Estou muito honrado. É, conheço o Brasil bastante bem. Quando eu era jovem, tive o privilégio de viajar para o Brasil, conhecer um pouquinho, fiquei namorado do sol, das praias, da música, da gente, da astronomia brasileira também. É, então, muito obrigado ainda. But don't worry, this is not going to be in Portuguese, so we'll switch quickly to, uh, to, to English. And uh, what I'm going to tell you a little bit is about uh, cold dark matter and the status of cold dark matter and how we can test this paradigm of uh, structure formation that we have um, using observations of, uh, on nonlinear scale, in particular observations of, of, um, of galaxies, individual galaxies. I guess I'm going to go into share my screen here. And hopefully you can see now my first slide. Uh, if that's okay, you just compare with me if, and then we can start. All right, so. No, sorry, okay. we are not. You're not. I think seeing. that now, yes. <laughs> now it starts. Thank you. Okay, so you see my screen and you hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay, great. All right, so the idea is to tell you a little bit about cold dark matter on, on small scales. Of course, you know, over the past uh, few decades, we have uh, built up, you know, using mostly observations of the cosmic micro background and of uh, the large scale structure of the universe, a model for what the universe is or what the universe isn't. And the model that came out of this, of course, a bit surprising, is made up today of a odd combination of uh, three main components, you know, order of matter, the minority of it in terms of matter and energy, and then dark matter, which is majority of the matter or the gravitating you know, fluid, if you want, in the universe, and then dark energy, some kind of mysterious you know, force that apparently dominates the, the latest expansion of the universe. And um, so how do we test this model? How can we make progress beyond just knowing what the constituents are? That was also where that's where cold dark matter comes in. And the way the way this works uh, is to give you just one simple example is, for example, you measure the structure of the universe on a very large scale. This is uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, a picture of a, a galaxy lecture survey that goes out to you know, very very far distances. What you do in this case is because you know how galaxies are distributed across the universe, you think of this as basically the count, for example, how many galaxies there are within a given volume. So they change the volume, and then the analysis will change. And what you do is in for any volume, you can place a volume like this little squares here, you can place on different parts of the universe, compute the average number of galaxies, subtract the actual number minus the average, and compute you know, the variance of that distribution. 
And when you do that, the merits of the distribution, you come up with something which is quite interesting. The variance, uh, is what I'm showing you here, is the variance for the solution delta m over m, uh, but it's the mass scale, so the average mass inside one of these volumes. And what you find is that using many different probes from the micro background to weak lensing, different metabolic clusters, to laminar for forest, et cetera, what you find is this very peculiar uh, dependence of the variance with mass. And that has, you know, seems to be like a power law on very large uh, masses, very large scales. And then it becomes, it bends over and turns into something kind of flat with the with small scales. And that is actually exactly the prediction that what you have if the universe is dominated for by some collisionless, collisionless particle that have a very uh, small thermal motions uh, close to the early universe. And that is just uh, what we call cold dark matter. The way this works is that basically the initial density equations were a power law for scale three, and this bend just happens because the universe basically at some point transitioned from being uh, made of radiation to being made of matter. And that bend is imprinted by this. Now, this uh, dashed line, which is a prediction of the model, except for just the, the particular parameter of you know, when this bend occurs, is a prediction of the model. And you can see that it matches the observations over, you know, 10 decades in advance. When you see some, this kind of agreements, the first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, there's something right about this. There's something incredibly profound about the simple idea that the universe is, at least matter of the universe is dominated by a simple uh, particle that uh, behaves in this way, like cold dark. The question is, the other interesting thing, if you look at the, the y-axis now here, you can see it goes from 10 to minus 6 to about 1. In other words, these fluctuations are small, very small. Most of this work has been done in what we call the linear regime, where these predictions, this dashed line, can be made you know, very accurately, and where the observations are perhaps easier to interpret. Of course, We'd like to test this model now, and we'd like to test it in different ways. For example, one way you can test it is by going towards lower mass scales than the ones that I'm showing here. This stops at you know, 10 to the 12. So the masses, they can go to 10, 10 to 9, 10. So does this continue in the way that we expect? And that is, you know, uh, one thing that we can try. This is the same plot, now kind of reverse. If you want, I'm plotting now mass. Uh, Increasing mass towards the left, but it's the same plot as before. And these are particular models of dark matter. Of dark matter. You see, if you extend now the mass scale towards lower and lower masses, now towards the right, you see that the behavior is different. For example, the particle that makes the dark matter is not called one percent of the fault. So it's uh, so this is one thing we can try to pin down in order to to get better. So go go towards. Lower and lower, smaller and more, the smaller and smaller mass scale. The problem with this, though, is that most of the scales are inaccessible to observation except at local and local uh, and local environments, so close to us in the local universe. Unfortunately, you do that, those scales are all nonlinear. They have already collapsed. They have already become something different. So we cannot test them directly in this way. Um, so. Um, so when we do this, when we sort of extend these observations towards small scales, you know, we've encountered some issues things we call like matter, or at least, you know, people have noticed that there are some issues. And these issues uh, with this dark matter, some people call it a dark matter crisis or a cold dark matter crisis. And I you know, capitalized the three lines of evidence for the, the putative presence of the crisis. One is the fact that you know, if this particle is a particle, and the particle has a lot of properties, and there was a very you know, simple idea to say, oh, well, maybe the particle is a weakly interacting mass and particle, interacting mass and particle, like the WIMP, and therefore this is what uh, may solve actually other problems in particle physics as well. The problem with that is that the latest uh, results in this have come up now. In other words, all the searches that people have done for particles like WIMPs have come up empty. 
And um, this is the latest one, the Xenon 1T, the latest results from those searches for what is not the experiments. And there are 14 basic and 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 basic so it isn't clear what is it like matter at this point. So that crisis comes from interact with that. Many of the models of like matter, of product matter, how did that the black matter is a majorana particle, which is its own antiparticle, it's from high density regions, which should divide and manipulate to reduce the radiation and make it down there. People look for these things. Uh, most of the gamma rays we expect should come from the galactic center or the region around the galactic center where the galactic halo is densest. What you find is that there are some excess of that old gamma rays one can uh, uh, tell coming from close to the galactic center, but unfortunately, it's not clear that these gamma rays are actually coming from the manipulation of like matter. And one, of, one of the problems is that, for example, the spectrum of the gamma rays seems very consistent with the spectrum of pulsars. So, if uh, there was a population of pulsars still unidentified in the direction it was the like the like the bulge, then that would explain you know these results without any need for dark matter. So dark matter, yes, must exist because we see it in the structure of the universe. We see that it creates the, the structure universe as we as we described at the beginning, but we haven't been able to pin down its center. Beyond that. You know, there are other issues, you know, that come closer to the physical evidence that I would like to discuss, which have to do with dark matter on small scale, and the scales of galaxies, and the scales of uh, dwarf galaxies in particular. And then a list of problems here, which is in the slide, have to, you know, each of the people have come up saying, well, you know, that all dark matter cannot explain this issue as cascos of floor, or mixing satellites, etc. So, it's interesting that you know because all the other searches for like that have failed, astrophysics is the is in the unenviable position, perhaps of being the only one, the only man, the only means to make progress with this, with this quest, you know, to um, dig deeper into what the dark matter might might be. So let's cut a few of those of these things here on a front for all of them, all of these problems. But let's cut a few and I'll try to emphasize. What I consider to be actually successes of all that method. In other words, many of these problems, although they appear as sometimes you know, difficult, they actually uh, they all they all have in my opinion resolutions that are very palatable, very plausible within the cold dark matter paradigm. So I'll start with a little introduction of cold dark matter, what we need to know of cold dark matter, cold matter on small scales, and then I'll go through a list to how far I can go in a list of you know, the problems and seeing how we explain them within all that matter. So, the internet of all that matter, if all that matter is, is really a luminous particle and has a very negligible thermal velocity, then um, the only thing that matters is, you know, uh, that's in fact with light and, and it interacts weakly with other particles, the only thing that matters is the Then, all that matter has initial conditions that are very well those were the power section that I showed you at the beginning, and that's just this ratio for 10 decades in mass. We just can take the power spectrum and put that data into a, into a computer and evolve that. And now with that, um, you know, art, if you want, the in body simulation art now has become uh, quite uh, well spread, and there's very good agreement uh, between different groups doing this. And now I I would say that you know, we have been able to characterize the clustering of cold dark matter on any scale that matters for hypothetical observations, you know, for, for the kind of an extragalactic observations. So if the universe was made only of cold dark matter, this problem would be this. So we know how dark matter clusters on very large scales, and this is just this zoom onto the scales that are very, very linear, so on very large scales. Perturbations are small. As you go towards smaller, smaller scales, and you focus on regions that have collapsed, it goes compared to then in the nonlinear regime. So, we'd like to see, review what are the predictions of contact matter in the nonlinear regime, and then see how we can test those using extra ranges. So, 
So in the nonlinear regime, in, in regions of the universe where the crossing time becomes shorter than the age of the universe, like the defined regime, the dark matter seems to collapse and form these kind of monolithic structures with a very well-defined center and a well-defined density profile around it. We call those things dark matter halos. We believe that these are the suns where galaxies form. The relations of the that I mentioned before have led us to a good understanding of what is the abundance of this dark matter halos of function of mass, the clustering, how they cluster together, and also their non-linear structure. I'll give an example here. So two examples. These are two dark matter halos. One uh, actually is a galaxy cluster on the right, then there are 15 solar masses. The other one is a galactic halo, then there are 12, and there's another one. But I think you know, I've been showing you too, it illustrates one of the main properties of this. I think you know that if you look at the, the one on the right, the one on the left, it's the same. The little bit of change is like this tail here, that I would really, I strung if you want the image of a galaxy cluster, which is about much, much bigger than a galactic halo, so that they both appear to have the same burial radius as we call it. And this is an important so definition. So stay with me. So we define this and we define this the mass of the cluster of a halo, we define the mass of it by looking at its visual radius, which is the radius you can find by finding the center of a halo and then walking out until the time it will take for a circular orbit to go around is about the age of the universe. That is what we call the visual radius, the mass inside our radius of the, mass of the halo. And because you know, defined in, time, in using a time, a crossing time, crossing time, of course, equivalent to a density in a gravitational dominant system, we're talking about objects, halos, we define them to have uh, similar densities. And, uh, and of course, we have similar densities, mass over the density cube will be constant, and for the mass will be proportional to the velocity of the particle run around to the cube. Okay, so what else um, can we tell about this? Oh, just to give you the scale of a galaxy in this dark matter halo. The galaxy is a really tiny little you know, droplet of light in the center of the dark matter halo. So we talk about the nonlinear structure that we can probe with galaxies. We'll be talking about the structures in the very, very, very inner region of this whole dark matter halo. What do we know about this dark matter halos? And I think we know is that the density profiles, the similarity was not just a visual impression. If you actually look at the density as a function of radius, in other words, I go to the center and also take a look at the density in spherical shells and I plot the density versus radius, I get curves like this. These are four different halos, different masses going from a, a galaxy cluster on the right to a dwarf galaxy on the left. It's a five decade mass, if I recall correctly. And what you find is that the profile is not a power law like many people expected, but it's actually curves. It comes in a very particular way. It goes from, you know, a, in, a, in a region which appears to kind of diverge like a power law, and that power law curves and curves and curves over and becomes you know, quite sharp in the outer parts. But that can be, of course, mimicked by a simple formula here, just one example. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that the same formula just changing the scaling parameters, in other words, the characteristic density and the characteristic radius is the same. That was if I take this halo here, for example, on the left, and I shift it to the down a bit and to the right, will match exactly on the, on the one of it. So in that sense, dark matter halos are self-similar. Just by knowing one dark matter halo, I can predict the properties of all dark matter halos, which is a great simplification. And of course, that's what people call the Navarro Frank. Y profile uh, of a paper we wrote in the late 90s uh, on this. It's interesting, but the, all, the only thing we know for a given, we need to know for a given halo mass is just one number, which is you know, scale radius or where the curvature um, is. That's interesting. The other interesting thing is that to think if all halos look similar, scaled properly, all halos look different if I don't scale them. What means is that this 
curves, the curves, the dark matter density profile of two halos of different masses, they don't cross. I can see this over here. These curves don't cross. And for example, in the way this is closer to what we can measure is by looking at the circular velocity profiles. In other words, what is the fugitive or the, the velocity of a circular or a test particle in a circular orbit as it goes around at different radii from the center? Now, halos of different masses that have different velocities, more massive halos can have different potential whereas higher velocities. And you can see them here. If there, are, there are six different halo masses. I see they're all basically the same with a little bit of scatter around it. So um, the peak of what the profile goes from the inner regions is lower the inner regions, goes up, reaches the maximum, and then it drops again to the sort of part. And they're all the same. So I can take the one lower here, the lower one here, shift it to the right and go up, and I'll match the top one to become a cluster. Because these things don't cross, I need a simple measurement. If I measure the velocity, if I measure velocity at any radius, I know everything about that halo. I know the full mass of that halo. I haven't seen single, single measurement. So that's important. We'll get back to that at some point. The other thing that's important about contact matter halo is that we know their numbers. We know how many there are as a function of mass. That's very well known. This curve here, the black curve here, shows just a bunch of mass, how many there are for the unit volume. And then the rhythmic mass in this case. This is the mass function of plasmatic halos. And because plasmatic halos are the sites of galaxy formation in, you know, in cold dark nature, we tend to have, or like to have, more one to one correspondence between plasmatic halos. And galaxies, galaxies wouldn't form if there was no dark matter, if there no dark matter halos. You can compare then the galaxy mass function, the right panel, the right black curve here, with the, the galaxy stellar mass function, which is what I'm showing here on the left in color, and then say, well, there is, there must be a correspondence between the two. First correspondence may be, uh, maybe, in you know, very different ways. The simplest way of making a correspondence is something that is useful is to think of, in terms of, rather than in terms of mass, the x axis here, think in terms of abundance, which is the y axis here, how many there are per unit volume. And say, oh, I have a galaxy here, and then there are 12 solar masses and stars. There are as many of those within a large volume as there are halos of the concept of 14 solar masses. You see, if I can join vertically one point here to the point here. There are as many of those, and then making the plausible assumption that more massive halos have more massive galaxies, one can construct then a link between the mass of a halo and the mass of a galaxy for any planet okay. by joining these things horizontally. Interestingly, because the galaxy's star mass function becomes very shallow. At the faint ends, the lower at small masses, and so as we have it then, which it becomes very shallow, you see what happens as I approach a particular mass in the halo, that becomes exactly flat. Okay. Then all galaxies over a very wide range of masses, stellar masses, do all be living in the same halo. They all would have the same halo mass. In other words, the relation between galaxy mass and the halo mass. Is very nonlinear and close to the lower mass halos to become very, very steep. It should actually almost cut off as, as if there were like a fractal of halo masses below which we don't form any, 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 any luminous masses. So here, this is now galaxy mass versus halo mass. You see how the speed with this cuts off. By 10 to the 10 solar masses, you already. Uh, galaxy stellar masses are available to a lot of clusters, so very, very, very faint galaxies, very difficult to, to detect them. Most of them mean that they are produced with our sociological problems. Yes, so think of this as kind of a process mental, it's in detail not exactly true, but then it's, it's good to have this mental picture. There's a threshold below certain uh, halo masses, there are no, no galaxies, no galaxies. Now, the 80s, uh, sorry, uh, so, sorry to interrupt to you, Julio. Yeah. 
uh, the, the audio is uh, somewhat uh, stable. Maybe you could uh, turn off your camera to, to see if you have a, a better uh, quality of this, the audio. Oh, yeah. hmm. Let's see. I'm not exactly sure how to turn off my camera, but <laughs> we can try stop video. Okay, it's oh, okay. It's fine. Let's see how. Thank you. Can you still see my screen, though? Or? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. All right. So now, now we're aided now by by not just by these uh, simple models like this abundance matching that I was telling you, but actually by the fact that we can simulate now not only the dark matter. In cold dark matter, but also how galaxies form. This has been the result of you know a lot of a huge investment in algorithmic development over many years, and by groups that I belong to, like Virgo Consortium, by other uh, others as well. Where now we can actually uh, populate. I mean, naturally by following the evolution of gas and the star formation and the feedback from star formation and and galactic galactic nuclei, you can you know, generate a. a, a Galaxies, if I see here on the left, those galaxies actually are simulated galaxies, although in many cases they are indistinguishable from, from observed galaxies. And these simulations are able to match you know, the galaxy stellar mass function, as you can see over here, down to masses of 10 to the 8 solar masses or so. Okay. Um, so, in, and what you the one thing to take away from here is that the simulation actually match very, very well the abundance matching predictions. So the only way that you can actually match this, yeah, we learn now, this LSS is a mass function is by matching the abundance matching prediction. So the matching, matching predictions that, we, that I showed you before, and the, the one before, are actually very, very similar to this. Um, we can go, this is 10 to the 8 solar masses. Of course, we can go to much lower masses by using, uh, by now looking at smaller volumes. Okay? And um, one of the things we've done is a different project which simulates the local group, basically two, two galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way that are coming together in a pair. You can see this here, this is the dark matter of a local group. We call this simulation project the Apostle simulation, project of simulating the local environments. Um, this is in gas and uh, this is in stars. And you can see here the stars and the very large paddle tails. You can see, for example, in the gas, um, if I show you again the gas, there are things like the, like the Magellanic screen coming out of one of a massive uh, satellite, uh, et cetera. So you can study many, many things here. And one of the things we, we learn from the simulations is that it is indeed true that below a certain mass, below about 10 to the 10 solar masses or so, the star formation, the ability of, of a halo to form stars basically disappears. This idea there is almost a threshold of gas information seems to be correct. And uh, this is actually quite important. So below 10 to the 10 solar masses, uh, to have a say, number in mind, or below 20 kilometers per second or so in, in, in velocity, cyclical velocity, there are no luminous galaxies, at least that are very uh, prevalent in, in, local, in the local universe. Okay. So those are the main things we need to keep in mind in order to, be, uh, to address now the uh, the problems that I had highlighted at the beginning. Right? So we'll start with two of them. We'll go very quickly through many of them uh, and trying to get as far uh, as, uh, as possible into, into this discussion. So there are two problems that people have highlighted over the years. One is called the missing satellites problem, and the other one is the tweak to fail problem. So I'll discuss both of them together very briefly. The missing satellites problem has to do with the fact that there are many, many, many small clumps of dark matter than there are galaxies, luminous galaxies observed. This is one example. This is from the Apostle simulation. We've seen the gray line here is the number of clumps of dark matter, a cumulative number of clumps of dark matter within about a volume of two megaparsecs around the, the pair, the pair of uh, the Milky Way and M31. And you can see the numbers skyrocket, right? As soon as you go to, uh, to 10 to the nine solar masses, you already have hundreds and hundreds. And this goes actually to thousands and thousands of, uh, of objects when you go to say 10 to the eight or 10 to the seven solar masses. Compare that with the number of observed luminous galaxies. This is the blue kind of histogram looking thing here. This is actually the, the known number of galaxies 
more massive than about 10 to the 5 solar masses here in the same volume. Yeah, there are only 60 or so galaxies known. So why are there so many cold dark matter halos and so few satellites or dwarf galaxies? And again, the explanation is easy if you remember what I told you about the threshold below about you know, 10 to the 10, close to 10 to the 10, there are no, there should be no luminous galaxies. So the reason why there are so few is because below say a few times under nine, under the 10 here, there are no luminous galaxies. So this actually in the simulation actually count them. And this is what you find because below 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10, there are no galaxies. Then these numbers here, this 70 or so match the numbers over here. So in other words, this idea that there is a very nonlinear dependence of gas mass and halo mass at lower masses can explain the number of world galaxies in the group, can also explain the number of satellites. Actually, it's a number of satellites around the Milky Way and Andromeda pretty well. Those are the gray lines here compared with the, the ones we cover. Okay, so there is no missing satellites problem in cold dark matter. And that, that missing satellites problem is solved by this the appearance of this you know, threshold between uh, quotes uh, in the galaxy formation in, in a halo mass to form luminous galaxies. I didn't mention that, but the threshold is actually easy to understand why there should be a threshold. And it comes uh, mostly because of the universe becomes uh, ionized by the first you know, stars and first uh, black holes that form early on in the universe, a redshift of you know, 10 or so, the universe becomes ionized, the ionization eats the gas, and the gas is not able to fall into the potential of low mass halos below you know, 10 to 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses, and therefore it cannot form any luminous galaxies. So that's the, uh, an astrophysical solution to the satellites, the, the missing satellites problem. Now, another um, problem that people talked about is a, something called the too big to fail problem. And it has to do with the idea that, well, we formed the galaxies in these halos and, you know, we put them together, but uh, are the simulations, are, are, the, are the, the, you know, the, this model, the cold dark matter model, able to account for the property, the internal properties of, uh, of these dwarf galaxies? I'll give you an example here. I told you by measuring the mass in one point or the velocity, the super velocity in one point of the galaxy, we can able to, we're able to tell everything about the halo mass in which it lies. So these are satellites of the Milky Way for which we can do that. We can measure the mass within one point. In this case, an example, Earth minor here, we can measure the mass within 600 parsecs and the mass is corresponds to a super velocity of about 20 kilometers per second. Okay. Now this is the predictions from the model that I just done before, this and Navarro Frank White like models. And uh, there's only one curve that was this point and it has a maximum velocity of about 24 kilometers per second. I'll look at another one, Draco here. We can measure it at about 300 parsecs and it has corresponds to the same velocity. Let's look at another one, Fornax here. Fornax is, we can measure at what, about a kiloparsec and it has a velocity response to about 18 kilometers per second. The problem with this is that Fornax, which has a velocity or a mass that is lower than that of Draco, Fornax, as we know, is actually Hundred thousand times, well, no, sorry, a uh, hundred times more luminous than than Draco. So how can it be a hundred times more luminous and yet have a halo that's that's less massive than Draco? So in other words, it seems that in, as if once we want to look at satellites, at least in the Milky Way, where we can do this, it seems that things get turned around. The prediction for the cold matter, dark matter paradigm which tells you that you know most more massive things have more massive galaxies seems to be seems to not work anymore. Why? Why is that? And people have discussed this in many different ways, saying that perhaps the dark matter is not cold dark matter. That this this you know this um, uh, equivalence between you know measuring the mass at one point and not is violated, etc. I think there's a simple explanation to this, which is the effects of tides. The satellite is, of course, subject to the tide of the main galaxy. And once you take that into account, and this we did in this in Apostle again, you have uh, you this is what you encounter. 
that because the tides depend on the orbit, you can have a very massive object that gets close to the center of the galaxy and is stripped of most of its mass. So when you measure it today, its mass may appear lower than the mass of a small object that has less lost, that has lost less mass. In other words, there's a large scatter that tells us stripping in prints on the relation between halo mass, characterized here by Vmax, and the luminosity of the galaxy. These all the red points here. here. So it's a large scatter. So you have a few things over here that are very faint and have very large uh, halo masses, and things that are very bright, like this one here, and have tiny halo masses. And that's just because of tidal stripping. When you put that into account, then the into account, this is what you end up having. This is now the new cumulative number function of mass that comes out of this relation. You see, there is a very good agreement between, between the subtle luminosity function of the Milky Way and that of the simulations. So, in other words, uh, the apostle simulations, and other simulations as well, this is not just our, our work, other people coincide with us, uh, are able to explain relatively easily this missing satellite problem and this big to fail. Oh, so these are not problems for cold dark matter. They, thought that they were thought to be problems a few years ago. Now they're considered, I think, widely uh, agreed that there are no, there are no problems anymore. These problems have been solved. And without appealing to anything, to any change in cold dark matter, these are just basically results of the astrophysics of the problem, which of course becomes very complicated. I need to look at it in detail. Let me tell you about some other thing, which is I find interesting in a paper called recently. And it has to do with galaxy scaling laws. And particular things like the Tyler Fisher relation for spirals, the fundamental plane uh, for, for ellipticals. So let me remind you what these things, these things are and how cold dark matter can provide a natural explanation for these things as well. Let's start with Tyler Fisher relation for spirals. This is a relation, of course, between the velocity of rotation of a disk in a, a spiral and the luminosity of a of stellar mass. Okay. You can see here, this is from the original paper, Italian Fisher, 1977, there are a bunch of galaxies here. And you can see this, um, the relation is almost the same as the luminosity B cube relation, or if you want a mass, stellar mass, portion of the luminosity, B cube relation. This is actually very similar to the mass signal velocity of halos that I highlighted at the beginning. Okay, halo that is, you know, you know, quite where the velocities are, twice as high would have eight times, uh, would be eight times more massive than another halo. Okay, so th this is power law scaling is actually uh, interesting and it's very, uh, it comes out naturally of this association between, you know, galaxy mass and uh, velocity, and halo velocity. The problem has been uh, with that idea has been explaining another property of the telefish relation, which is the independence of the telefish relation on surface brightness. So in other words, you can, if you take two galaxies of the same stellar mass, they can have very different radii. One may be a low surface brightness galaxy and one be a high surface brightness galaxy. And even though they have very different radii, the velocity that they have, the rotation velocity is pretty much the same. In other words, look at here, this is stellar mass here, radius, you can see the very large scatter on the given stellar mass, but yet the scatter in velocity is actually much, much smaller. And also there is no correlation. So here you can, for example, one that is small, you expect, oh, if it's small, you should have a higher velocity than the one that is that is high, just from the real theorem. And that is not the case. That does not happen in in in, in Pali Fisher galaxies. Why, why not? And how what does that, what does that mean? Okay. You know, in other kinds of galaxies where this is not true, where the surface brightness is important, the size of the galaxy is important, is that it's velocity. And those are of course elliptical galaxies where the scaling relations uh, take into account, not just the, the mass and the velocity, but the size becomes important. And uh, although it's not exactly the same as the Virial theorem, it's more or less what you expect from the Virial theorem. You take an elliptical like this one, and you measure its characteristic velocities, and you take another, another elliptical like this one, but uh, same stellar mass, but much smaller, the velocity to measure actually be much higher. And the other way around, if, we, if the radius of this elliptical were much, much, much bigger, the, rate, the velocity would be much lower. Okay, so in ellipticals, size matters. In the spirals, 
size does not matter for the scaling relations. Why is that? Where does that come from? Does that have a simple explanation? And it actually does. And this, I can explain this in this, you know, this plot here. Uh, this is the circular velocity profile of one of these Navarro Frank White uh, halos. Okay? This is the red line here. Okay? And I'm fixing the mass here. And this is a prediction. Now, the, the polymer makes a prediction for a velocity of 150 glass per second or so. This is the dark matter profile. Of course, the dark matter, um, you have to form a galaxy in it. Imagine you form a galaxy that is very large. It has a very large radius, enormous radius, okay? Oh, sorry, the other thing you would know is that this, this velocity of the halo corresponds to a halo mass. And the abundance matching, a halo mass corresponds to a stellar mass. And we know that we cannot change that because otherwise we'll, we'll miss the number density of galaxies. So fixing the halo, mass fixes the velocity profile and fixes the stellar mass of that galaxy. What it doesn't fix is the radius of the galaxy. The radius can change. Okay? So imagine you have a galaxy that's very, 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 very large. Okay, it has that, this mass, 10 to the 10.5, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 10. It has a very, it's very large. So we're spreading this 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 10.5 solar masses over a very large radius. Imagine half mass radius was this big, like 30 kiloparsecs. Its contribution to the signal velocity would be negligible. Okay? It would be this, this bottom blue curve here. When you add it to the red curve, you get a curve like this one, like the first solid black line. The velocity at the half light radius, which is what you measure for the Tyler Fisher, would be this point over here, this circle here. Now, if I take the same mass and I make the galaxy smaller, so it's not a mass, I don't change the halo smaller here from 30 to 20, you see the importance of the, of the luminous component becomes higher because I'm compressing it, gm over r, r is becoming smaller, m is the same, it's coming higher, and you go to this second curve. And then the third curve, if I make it even smaller, and if I make it even smaller, or even smaller. And so you see that when I change the galaxy size from about three kiloparsecs, to 30 kiloparsecs by a factor of 10 in radius, the characteristic velocity of that disk, this uh, empty circles here, doesn't change. It's basically horizontal. In other words, disks are forming tall dark matter halos that have this particular mass profile become independent of surface brightness. And that is the reason why in the telefacial relation is independent of surface brightness. For two reasons. One, because the dark matter is number of bank white like in this mass distribution. It also has the right parameters. It could have been this shape, but it could have been you know, much, much steeper or much more concentrated or not. So that matter has the right properties to explain this. It also has another interesting consequence. You see, I stopped at about three kiloparsecs here. If the galaxy became much smaller than three kiloparsecs, then the velocity would start increasing. Because now the luminous component dominates over the dark matter. Dark matter, you see, becomes irrelevant here. And it dominates. And there is a regime then where the luminous component becomes, becomes very important and where size matters. And that explains the dichotomy between ellipticals and spirals. The reason why in ellipticals the size is important is because the ellipticals are dense, they're very concentrated within their own halos. The reason why in the spirals, the velocities measurements are independent of size is because they're sampling the outer parts of the halo and they're basically adding up enough, uh, enough mass in the inner regions to explain this plant thing. So this actually works not just qualitatively, which is what I'm using here just to motivate the idea, but actually quantitatively as well. So I'll show you in the, in the next few uh, slides. This is the abundance match relation in the Eagle simulations. You can see uh, this is the, the prediction from the abundance matching. It works quite well. It's a sort of mass, halo mass relation, it works quite well. And then this same prediction gives you this polyfisher relation here. This is selecting disk galaxies and measuring the velocities compared to the observed polyfisher relation, which is on the left. The, the simulated relation here is uh, on the right is shown here with this gray line. You can see it works very well, both in the zero point, the scatter, uh, the slope, 
everything works out very, very well. And this is not a trivial result, right? It comes out of the fact that we have the right shape for the math profile. This is, remember, this is a very nonlinear prediction, right? This we're predicting the properties of dark matter, how the math matter is distributed in the inner few kiloparsecs when the virial radius is hundreds and hundreds of kiloparsecs. But this is a result that's completely non trivial and that is uh, underpins our understanding of where, where the telefish relation comes from. You can, of course, go back, go to extend these ellipticals, as I said. They can plot now. And what I'm doing here is plotting the circular velocity, the typical velocity of a galaxy versus the radius of a galaxy. And these lines, the here different colors, are predictions from the simple model. Take a they call that a halo at the galaxy. And if it's if it's the large, if the galaxy is very large, you're on the right here, basically the galaxy doesn't matter. This is flat, it's independent of surface brightness. But if it's small, it goes up. And there's a critical radius where every star, each star mass, below which the, the size matters, and below, and beyond which the size does not matter. Okay? Ellipticals are on this regime, spirals are on this regime. Okay? So in other words, you can think of this as a as a mapping between two points, between a point in this plane and a stellar mass. We can go further because the, these lines are constant stellar mass. We can turn mass, stellar mass, and radius into surface brightness or surface density of stars and do the same plot. And basically, we have these families of curves now that can map a surface brightness of a galaxy and a characteristic velocity into a stellar mass. The interesting thing about this is that this velocity is independent of distance. Surface brightness is independent of distance. We have a measure that's independent of distance that can be mapped through this modeling with two stellar maps, which of course depends, compared with an observable luminosity, depends on distance. We use this as a, as a distance indicator, which combines, of course, we're combining the fundamental plane with the telefish relation in this, in this mapping. And I can actually do this fairly well in the simulations. This works incredibly well. We can just Pick a point, any point here will turn into a stellar mass, and you can plot well, predicted versus versus true stellar mass. You see that this curve which is you know, very, very well represented by one to one with an RMS which is tiny, it's like 0 0.07, 0 0.07 dex. You can apply this to observations, of course, as well. It works. I mean, the other, of course, in simulations that we have no error since then, you know, so you have other issues, you know, estimates velocities, etc. It's, it's a bit more complicated, but actually. What you get from such a very simple estimator is actually quite quite good. It's comparable in its accuracy to, to some of the better you know, official relations, et cetera. And this is, again, I want to say, emphasize, this is not a trivial result. This comes out of the fact that um, both that matter works. Okay, let me spend the rest of my five or 10 minutes that I may have talking about a different problem, which is uh, also quite, um, is a risk lower press. We will call the talk of the core problem or the diversity problem. And it has to do with this idea that the, the, the dark matter has this you know, divergent you know, power law behavior and a density profile near the center. But I think we'd be able to recast this problem in a different way. And I think the right way of thinking about this problem is the following At a given mass scale, cold dark matter predicts that all galaxies should be show the same halo. So I was showing before. When you go to the dwarf galaxy regime, things start to appear complicated. For example, take these four galaxies, and the four galaxies have the same circular velocity, more or less, in the outer parts. And uh, so you say, oh, if I know the circular velocity on one point over here, say, I can draw this halo. I can draw this circular velocity profile at all radii. And moreover, it should be the same for all galaxies. So take a galaxy like this one, for example, uh, UC, UC 5721, this is the dark matter halo, and the galaxy goes over. Well, that we can understand. Variance, the luminous part, contributes. It brings the matter of the velocities up, and you can explain this right to the well. In this case, uh, over here, the same, well, the galaxy is much more extended. Now the variance are relevant, the luminous part is relevant, and therefore you just see the dark matter. So these two are in good agreement with what we expect. When you go to galaxies like the ones at the bottom, though, this one, in particular the one on the right, that doesn't seem to work. 
In other words, the velocities you predict just from the dark matter without you know, taking out the, the, the luminous component, it's already much, much higher than what you in principle measure. Why is this? Why is the deficit of matter in the inner regions? Okay. So this is what people call a galaxy with a core. The galaxy is not cuspy, a galaxy that violates you no know, predictions of cold dark matter. But to me, it's more important to think of this in terms of a deficit of matter in the inner regions, especially compared with other galaxies of the same velocity. You learn a few things here. For example, that, that this, this problem does not apply to all galaxies, it applies to some galaxies only, but some galaxies are perfectly consistent with cold dark matter. Some galaxies are not. It seems that, it, that there's no simple solution to this. It's not like I say, oh, I'll put a core or I'll, I'll remove the cusp uh, of dark matter in all halos and everything will work well. No, it won't work because the you know, galaxies are actually consistent with cold dark matter. The solution is a bit more complicated. You can see this and we can explain this in, or illustrate this in a different way. Take galaxies, uh, let's plot two numbers. Let's take the velocity in the inner regions here, in which case two kiloparsecs, and the velocity in the outer parts. Okay, velocity in the inner regions, velocity in the outer parts. And we can plot one versus the other. Okay, plot the one versus the other. This is what you, because in cold dark matter, knowing the velocity in one case tells you velocity everywhere, there's a very strong correlation between the two. Velocity at two kiloparsecs tells the velocity, the maximum stick of velocity. You see here we expect. This is what you, this is what happens when you add baryons. It becomes a little different, especially at massive galaxies, because the baryons are important. But in the in dwarf galaxies, the dark matter dominate, it doesn't matter, you expect something like this. But this is the observations. This is what a bunch of dwarf galaxies. You see, some are actually quite consistent with cold dark matter, the ones at the top here, but these ones over here are not. Why? Why is this happening? How can I get any more clues about this? This is something that many things have been proposed. Of course, one is completely modifying dark matter, for example, assuming that there's self interactions in dark matter. Another one is assuming that the formation of the galaxy can change the mass profile of the dark matter. Another one is just basically these are, we're misled by large uncertainties in the way we analyze the data. So I'll go quickly to this. Um, the first one is that the galaxy formation changes the inner regions of the dark matter halo. That uh, can be simulated, people have simulated this. And basically what happens is that the baryons collapse at the center and then they get expelled by, you know, supernova feedback or you know, AGM feedback that, um, that basically, and then and in that motion in and out change the potential, the dark matter re reacts differently to change the potential and you can create these cores. Interestingly, the cores can appear when you expel the baryons because the potential gets lower, but will re the cusp will reappear, the baryons get concentrated. So you expect, for example, the galaxies without cores should be dominated by baryons in the inner regions in the particular scenario. There's another possibility, which is the fact that you can just change dark matter. Say so it's not cold dark matter because dark matter now has some kind of self-interaction. The simplest self-interaction could be just a collision term, right? Where Two particles will collide elastically, there won't be loss of energy, but will just change that direction when they collide. In the inner regions, when they collide, they will start thermalizing. And because the velocity dispersion of a cold dark matter halo drops to this inner region, you see the black curve here, velocity dispersion radius drops, the thermalization will lead to an increase in the velocity dispersion of the inner regions and a decrease in the density. If the density from this cusp will become a core. Okay, that will quickly change the mass profile of the halo, and that could, in principle, explain some of these galaxies where there's this deficit of, uh, of dark matter in the inner regions. I mean, of course, um, it gets a bit more complicated. If you now create, have a very, very, very dominant baryon dominated galaxy in the center, the potential gets deeper, and the velocity dispersion will increase, and the density will increase as well. So you can actually regenerate a cusp in these models by packing together a lot of a lot of a lot of variants. But a general prediction would be that variants should dominate in the regions galaxies with cores. Actually we can do we can check these predictions. We can check predictions by by comparing the the rotation curves of galaxies of different of different masses. Okay, so we'll compare again the velocity in the inner regions, velocity in the outer regions, we can com compute one number, let's call this eta rot, the ratio of the velocity in the inner regions, velocity in the outer regions. That measure basically how rapidly the rotation curve rises 
If the number is one, it means that it's kind of flat for the inner regions. You have a very flat rotation curve like in this case. Okay. And the other one is you know, how important the variance are. We know how important the variance are. So this would be the distance between this curve, the, which is the velocity contributed by the variance, and the actual velocity. So between this point and this point, this is the, the, the distance, the ratio, measures the importance of the variance in this, in this uh, regime. Okay. So this is what you find. We plot that at the rod, the shape of the rotation curve, you know, slowly rising or flat, versus the importance of the variance in the inner regions. So look only at the red points here. And there's a very strong correlation here, well, strong by astronomical standards. We see there are lots of lots of hey, uh, galaxies over here where there are no cores. These are consistent with cold dark matter, where variance are irrelevant. Right? The eta bar is low, but the eta rod is high. And the other way around, in galaxies where the cores are very important, the eta rod is low, the balance to be very important. And this is exactly the opposite of what the scenarios were telling us. The thing that the scenarios don't really explain what is going on. One simple explanation could be the fact, as I said, that no circular motions that affect the measurements that we have. And we can simulate this and simulation we find that no circular motions are actually quite, quite important in dwarf galaxies. And that can fool your measurements of the, of the velocity of, 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 the, of the inference of the reciprocal velocities. You want to go too well, you know, close in, in time here, so I'm going to be rushed here. But uh, if you now consider, for example, a galaxy that may have non scalar motions, you do expect this trend now just because of uncertainties in the measurements. You expect that, you know, if you interpret it incorrectly, you'll end up having galaxies that have basically where variants appear uh, to dominate in galaxies with cores. And they appear to be relevant in galaxies without, of course, you have the same kind of trend that you, you observe for dwarf galaxies if this is due to, to errors. So I think the jury is still out on this, uh, but it's clear that there is no simple explanation, at least to me, about whether the, this particular observations or rotation curves uh, are, um, are telling us that contact matter uh, is not just not correct I and mean, then we need to basically modify dramatically this paradigm so i would say i would just in the interest of time i'll i'll just present you a little summary here but the summary should be you know, the, the, the come with you is that um the full dark matter paradigm is actually incredibly successful uh, not only in the linear regime but also in the non-linear regime of individual galaxies and can explain i think fairly naturally almost uh, most of the properties of the galaxy, of the galaxy population, kinematics, scaling laws, and the detailed uh, kinematic properties. So I'll I'll stop here. Thank you for for your patience. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I I I thought that I had turned on my mic. I did that. So thank you very much, Julio. And uh, I think, uh, let me see if we have questions uh, at the YouTube, no, but uh, then we can move to Zoom. So um, if you have questions, please just raise your hand and then I can uh, open the microphone. Uh, yeah, Edu, please. Hi, Julio. Uh, my question is again uh, back to the missing satellites. Uh, so the clear-cut solution would be the UV radiation from reionization that would uh, not allow star formation to proceed in these small halos. So my 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 question is. Uh, since the star formation is uh, also not dependent on the temperature to avoid the, the cooling of the baryons in the dark matter halos, but also on the density, uh, uh, is there a time when, when at the lower redshift, so you would you would have conditions that uh, would allow actually star formation at, uh, at a lower 
UV background density, density flux. That means, in other words, so, so if the small halos are not forming stars, what are what is the fate of these small halos at low redshift? Are they around? Should we consider them as, as what we observe in Lyman Alpha forest or something? Because the, they would they would probably not be totally ionized. And the baryons would not totally be ionized, but in some sort of a, a neutron ionized equilibrium in which would uh, somehow be detectable as well. So are they around? That's a very good question. And first of all, I do. I haven't seen you in ages. But good remember, to remember us when we were both we were both young. I mean, you're still young. I mean, I clearly have age, <laughs> but you look you look amazing. But, <laughs> anyway, um, yes, it's, a, it's actually a very very good question. Question that I've been working on also. Uh, I didn't have time to go into this. But one of the predictions of this model, remember this threshold of of um, of star formation. So below a certain mass, just, I mean, it's a bit more complicated, but just to have an idea. You go in halo mass, you form galaxies. Below a certain mass, you don't form any galaxies. Okay. So what happens to the gas in those halos? I guess that's your question, right? So those halos just below the threshold are pretty massive, right? 10 to the 10 or 10 to 9, something like that. So they're massive, very massive. So they can hang on to the gas. It's just the gas doesn't get dense enough to turn into stars. So the gas must be there. I would actually work out what is the property step of the gas, and as you well pointed out, because we know the density profile, we know how much gas, can, and we know the properties of the UV background, this is an easy problem to solve. And uh, so there's a prediction that these models make that there should be in the vicinity of our galaxy, actually, in all the universe, in the vicinity of our local group in particular, a bunch of objects that are basically small halos filled with gas. The gas is most ionized because it's low density, but they may have an inner little core uh, where the gas is neutral. This in principle could be detected in emission by 21 centimeter or an absorption, of course, uh, of the background source. The complication came, of course, this is the idea of mini halos, and right? people have looked for this uh, quite, quite a lot in H1 surveys, etc. The problem that we learned is that what happens is that the gas, although it should be attached to these halos, is actually very vulnerable to run pressure stripping from just the environmental gas when you go to the local group, the local group, most of the barriers in the local group are not in the galaxies. They are actually spread around either in the halos of the two primaries and around it. Okay. So when a, a galaxy, a, a halo like this one, comes close to the local, to the, to the local group, the ambient density of gas in the local group is enough to actually strip the gas out of it. As the, gas, the, the halo becomes naked. But of course, it means that Halos that did, are a bit further away, are in voids or in lower density regions, they're not affected by this, and they should be there. Okay? This is something we worked out with uh, one of my former students, Alejandro Benitez Lambay, and we call these little clumps relics, reannotation limited H1 clouds, so the relics, relics of that formation. And it is a prediction, and if I'm, I can point you to the paper if you want further details. We're working on, on future papers on that as well. But I think, though, uh, unfortunately, there are not very many, and you know, pin, pinning down the exact numbers becomes a bit a bit tricky, but they should be there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Ricardo, please go ahead. Hi, hello. Uh, well, nice to meet you, Julio. Big fan. Hi. Uh, let, let me ask you, and, and full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm an author of one, one recent work about the usage of uh, intracluster light as an indicator of halo masses, of, of galaxy cluster masses. So do, do you have uh, any take on that, especially in terms of uh, how, how simulations, I mean, there have been a few works, recent works, using simulations to, to prove this sort of a uh, of, of mass indicator and uh, but of course uh, you 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 make tricks you 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 look at the the, the mass that uh, is 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 bound to the halo and the mass that well it's sort of elsewhere and calculate that so can can you comment on this sort of recent develop developments on the dark matter halo? Mm -hmm. 
Well, of course, you know, we've known of intercluster light for a long, long time. I mean, how to use that as a precision measurement of the mass of the halo, I think is a bit more controversial, a bit more, more indirect. Of course, we expect this star, the stars to be there because you know, they are, they will be stripped of stars of, of galaxies as they get merged to form the central central object. So I expect you know, and all the systems to be a strong dependence, not on the mass of the halo itself, but on the pro formation process of the central galaxy mostly. So in that sense, although of course there will be some relation between the halo mass and the central galaxy mass, it, it may be different in detail because of, you know, by luck, for example, one may have either a binary or three main galaxies in the halo and one have just one massive one because the merging process has gone all, all the way to full extent. And those three cases should have very different stellar halos or intercluster lights. So I think it'd be perhaps a, a better um, indicator of the formation process of the central galaxy rather than of the halo mass itself, of course. Although, of course, in, in general, everything correlates with mass to some extent, right? More mass, the things are bigger. Um, but I'd say it's, it's perhaps not a, a more detailed um, you know, witness of the formation of the central galaxy of the cluster rather than the cluster itself. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Fernando, please. Hi, Julio. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I am not from the area, so my, maybe my question is a little bit naive, but um, uh, I wonder if there is any correlation between the lack of dark matter uh, in the center of some galaxies, this problem of the cusp core dichotomy, and the morphology of the galaxy. For example, uh, the presence of bars, or, or the, the, the way that the spiral arms are developed or not, or not, if this have something to do with the fact that you have of having more or less dark matter concentrated in the center of, of the distribution? Yeah, it's a good question, um, Fernando. But uh, I mean, most of this where people have pointed out the presence of this cores, if you want, or this deficit of mass in the inner regions, or the deficit, deficit of dark matter in the inner regions, have all been in dwarf galaxies. And galaxies are basically, most of them, uh, dark matter dominated. So some dwarf, either dwarf regulars or dwarf um, spheroidals. And dwarf regulars, in fact, by the number, you can tell from by the name, they're very regular. They're not, I mean, there are no you know, big, nice bars, uh, except maybe for a very minority, right? Uh, so they're all quite regular galaxies, like the Magellanic galaxies, you know, with some kind of um, disk, uh, but not, not not particularly well developed, you know, spiral structure or or, or bar or bar structure. And those worlds, of course, they're kind of featureless, just as objects where their morphology is, is very is quite simple. Um, so the morphology, I think, you know, the, the morphology that in the way you mentioned it, you know, bars and very strong spirals, those are in very massive galaxies where there is no problem, there is no deficit of dark matter that has been that has been pointed out. So this is really a dwarf galaxy problem. It's a very small scale, small scale problem where morphology is, is a bit less of a less of a less of an issue in that sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So any more question? No, I guess no. Let me see at the YouTube if you have any questions, no. So uh, Julio, thank you very, very much for presenting this nice talk today. And I hope you have the chance to come to, to Rio in the next, in a future opportunity and to spend <laughs> some time with us as soon as all this is all over and we can come back to normal life, I hope so. I hope so, yeah, I'll, I'll hold you to your word in that case, okay? I'll be, I'll be there as soon as things get better. Okay, thank okay. you very much. A pleasure spending time with you. Bye. Bye, -bye. bye Edu. Bye. Bye-bye, Julie. Thank you, bye-bye.